Tschüss. Hi, welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around, I've got a complex one. Not complex for you, but complex for me. This month, uh, one of Australia's creative geniuses, Barry Humphreys, died at the age of 89. His legacy is very complex, but I'm going to talk about that toward the end of the video. I'm going to start out by talking about two movies he made in the 1970s which became part of the Osploitation renaissance in Australian film. They're both incredibly gross-out comedies. They're both a lot of fun. And I have a very long relationship with both of these films. So let's get started. The first movie was directed by the same director of Driving Miss Daisy, Bruce Beresford. And it is 1972's The Adventures of Barry McKenzie. The Adventures of Barry McKenzie started out as a comic strip written by Barry Humphreys and illustrated by Nicholas Garland which appeared in Private Eye magazine, the humour magazine that Peter Cook started in the 1960s. It's the story of an Australian guy who travels to England and meets all sorts of eccentric characters. He's racist, he's scared of women, he drinks way too much alcohol and goes on these really wild and weird adventures which satirise English culture as it was at the time and also uh, Australian exceptionalism because there were and still are a lot of people who are incredibly egotistical about their nationality here. And the comic strip was scathing and outrageous and considered obscene at the time and totally over the top, but it's worth getting. I've picked up the copies of it myself. I've got both volumes, I think, somewhere in the man cave. But in 1972, producer Philip Adams got together with Barry Humphreys and with Bruce Beresford and they created The Adventures of Barry Kesey, a movie version of this comic strip. They got a, a singer who was on television at the time, Barry Crocker, who'd been an entertainer since the late 1950s. I am wrong, be wrong. numbers too big to ignore, but I know too much to go back and pretend, yeah. He had the right look for Barry McKenzie. He was tall, gawky. He had a, a lantern jaw, and he could act the role, and he was good at doing kind of like comedy stuff. So he gets to play... Barry McKenzie, a guy who gets an inheritance and decides that he's going to visit the mother country, England, and see what's going on. Struth, who'd want to go to the dump where all them pond migrants are leaving in their millions? Unfortunately, he's accompanied by his auntie Edna, Edna Everidge, played by Barry Humphreys again. And there's a long history of Barry Humphreys playing the Edna character. He started out as a suburban housewife, which she is in the two Barry McKenzie movies but then went on to be Barry Humphrey's satirization of celebrity. She became increasingly sat out as housewife superstar. She was knighted to be a dame by the real Australian Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, in the second Barry McKenzie movie, and then went on to be an enormous star across the world. She satirized the royal family to their face. She punched upwards as much as downwards, and she became the mouthpiece for Barry Humphrey's scathing satirical wit, which went across the board. It was a shotgun approach. It punched up and punched down, which it did a lot of things. Bazaar and Edna travelled to London via Hong Kong, and there's some interesting bits of tourist montage in Hong Kong as well. And I always liked seeing Hong Kong as it was in the night, and so it reminds me of Kung Fu movies. They get to London, you know, the, the landlord in the cheap accommodation that Barry can find is played by Spike Milligan. It's one of the worst flats that you can imagine. It, it's run down, the gas and electricity run off a coin meter. It, it's just nightmarish stuff. England is portrayed in and not a great light in this one as well. There's dog shit all over the footpaths. Everybody's out to rip off the Australian naive guy who turns up there. He meets some interesting people. He's totally clueless. He's a virgin. So he has some interesting encounters with women, which really don't lead to ultimate satisfaction let's say but he is he's basically a naive idiot he gets involved with uh the record industry he does some australian folk songs which were written by barry humphreys and becomes something of a hit he and Artie end up visit um, an old family friend from the war years played by dennis price who's kind of interesting i like dennis price as you know and dennis price in this one plays a guy who, even though he is married and living in quiet suburbia somewhere in Surrey, 
is basically a bottom who likes to cosplay being a schoolboy. And uh, he kind of tries to lure Bazza into uh, a BDSM session in his library. Here it is. You better thrash me, sir. Go on. Don't spare me. I, I deserve it, sir. There's all sorts of weird stuff going on here, and actors like Dennis Price really play up to it. They, they're really good at it. He meets a school friend, a woman who is living with an older woman played by Judith First, and, uh, and then they meet the ex-husband of that woman who is living with the older woman played by Peter Cook, who's a producer for the BBC and gets Barry onto a an arts talk show that he does to talk about the Australian cultural renaissance, about which Barry knows absolutely nothing. He is clueless as shit, and so because he's nervous, he gets drunk, and sets the set on fire, and that leads to some other shenanigans. He also gets cast in a TV commercial for cigarettes. 99. Action, Barry. Try a high camp filter. They're cool in your mouth and firm between your hips. Which, again, is um, is a total disaster. And this is Barry Humphreys mocking the advertising industry as it was at that stage. Everybody gets a serve from this movie. When I first saw it and read the comics back in the 1970s, I was a very different person than I am now. I was laughing with Barry McKenzie, the Barry Crocker character, rather than laughing at him. All of his naivete and all of his skewed attitudes towards the world were attitudes to a certain extent that I shared. And it's only in years later when I've rewatched the film and I've learnt a lot and I've travelled and I've seen more of the world and I've grown up that I can see it from the other viewpoint. And I'm laughing at Barry McKenzie as much as I'm laughing at the stereotypes and the grotesques of um, England and English people and their weirdness. Now, this movie was crazily popular. It was the first Australian movie to make over a million dollars in a domestic box office. No other movie had ever done that. Apart from anything else, we did change over to uh, decimal currency in 1966. So before 1966, you couldn't make a million dollars anywhere. In come the dollars and in come the cents To replace the pounds and the shillings and the pence Because it was all pounds, shillings and pence But leaving that aside, crazily popular movie And it showed that people in Australia wanted to see movies about Australians Even if they were gross out, grotesque comedies With um, lots of vomiting and, and urination used as a fire extinguisher And all sorts of other things and kinky women and kinky men busty substances and BDSM and all sorts of other things people wanted to see the movie and people wanted to enjoy laughing at themselves as much as they were laughing at other people in the mother country so Barry, the Avengers of Barry and Kizzy, crazy popular the theme song was played on the radio a lot theme song by Smack of It's Given which is quite a good theme song, I like it and then in 1974, the sequel was made, Barry McKenzie Holds His Own. And it's probably the first movie where an Australian Prime Minister kisses a man in drag. But having said that, let's get to the start of the movie. So Barry and Edna are heading home from England. They stop off in Paris and two henchmen of a vampire, Count Plasma, played by Donald Pleasance, mistake Edna for Queen Elizabeth II. The Ministry of Tourism will do everything in its power to make your stay a joyous one. And kidnap her and take her to Transylvania. So Barry and his twin brother Kev, who is a priest, and is very unlike Barry, Barry Crocker plays both roles, decide to travel to Transylvania and rescue Edna so that Count Plasma can't have his wicked way and drain her and whatever else he wants to do. Now, Donald Pleasance is having a good time in this one. He's a lot of fun playing a vampire, and not the first time he played a vampire, but still, playing a vampire. So, in Paris, Barry has to get a whole bunch of his expatriate mates, including Clive James and a bunch of other people, to travel to Transylvania in disguise as a cultural exchange group, and rescue Edna from the vampire. Now, again, the gross-out humour everywhere, a little less nudity than the first one, but gross-out humour. And there's a terrific scene where Bazaar is on the top of the Eiffel Tower, feels a little sick, 
and vomits off the top of the tower and the expulsion lands on the henchman below. Yeah, again, this is a movie that you've got to watch in a cultural context of the 1970s. Gross out humour, stereotypes, attitudes that don't fly right now and probably never will again in a reasonable society. But it works. It's terrific fun. Uh, I like the idea of getting those character actors in. In the first movie, you got Dennis Price playing a furtive BDSM bottom. And in this one, you've got Donald Pleasance playing a vampire. So they're getting in some decent character actors. And there are a few other actors who are quite good in this one as well. Roy Kinnear turns up in this movie. And Tommy Trinder and John LeMessurier. Again, it was directed by Bruce Beresford and co-written between Beresford and Humphreys as the first movie was. And the cinematography is fantastic because the cinematographer was Don McAlpine who is one of the greatest Australian cinematographers. He did so many fantastic films. Let me have a look at his IMDb. I mean, this movie has the same cinematographer as Predator. It has the same cinematographer as Moscow on the Hudson, Parenthood, Patriot Games. Let's see what else we've got. Mrs. Doubtfire, again, and somebody in drag. A Romeo plus Juliet, the Baz Luhrmann film. Moulin Rouge as well, but yeah, it's another Baz Luhrmann film, so, but you've got to take the gig where you can get it. He's still going to this day. But I like the cinematography in this one. It works really well. And you don't really look at this kind of film for cinematography. But when I realised it was Don McAlpine, I went, I'm going to watch the cinematography this time. Chef's Kiss. Really well done. Who did the cinematography in the first one? I'm going to find this out now. Again, first movie, Donald McAlpine. So Don McAlpine did both of those. But that then brings me to the problematic aspect. Barry Humphreys died at a cultural polymath. He... he wrote poetry, he published books of naive Australian poetry from the 20th century, and Edna Everidge became a worldwide phenomenon. He also did things like compilations of pre-World War II music from Weimar, Germany, and from England, and all of the music of his childhood on CD. It's called So Rare. If you can find the So Rare compilations, they've got some deep cuts. They've got Conrad Veet singing a romantic ballad, if you will believe that which surprised the hell out of me when I saw it. I've got the So Rare discs here, and they're quite good value. He organised cabaret in the Adelaide Festival in the 2010s, where he recreated Weimar Germany cabaret, as in the movie Cabaret. Big cultural footprint here in Australia. For about 70 years, he was an entertainer in this country. But then in 2016, he shat the bed. He did an interview for the Spectator in England conservative magazine, and he also made some announcements in the public eye as Barry Humphreys, not as one of his characters, where he um, basically turned out to be incredibly transphobic and incredibly rude about gender affirmation surgery. He also made some racist comments about Asian immigration into Australia, did a whole bunch of repugnant shit, which, yeah, he was in his 80s at the time. But still, he dressed up in drag. You'd think you'd have a little more sympathy towards people whose body genders don't match the genders of their brains and their minds but he wasn't yeah he was an old guy he was 89 when he died there's no excuse for that that kind of cruelty uh comedy at its best either punches upwards or punches everybody equally punching downwards specifically in a serious utterance at a time when at a time when people are finding out that there are more than two genders and that you know, gender is a spectrum rather than just a binary that kind of short-sightedness and that kind of ugliness really knocked his legacy. The Melbourne Comedy Festival Awards, the Barrys were renamed in 2016-2017 because of his attitude to trans people. Uh, it really became a, a big thing here. And I think that that was the right choice. You can acknowledge all of the interesting and wonderful things and the way Barry Humphreys created Australian comedy in some ways and also Hannah's question, the kind of boring 1950s suburbia that we had and the insularity of Australia and our attitudes to things. He did a lot of good comedy about that kind of stuff. His characters, including the gross-out diplomat Les Patterson, who starred in a movie in 1987 called Les Patterson Saves the World, really hit out at what he saw as the problems with Australia and the world. I mean, when I was a teenager, I used to go to all of the stage shows that Barry Humphreys did. And isn't it pathetic at his age? And at least you can say that you've seen it. All of them turned up in theatre in 
Sydney where I was living. And I went to see the shows and I loved them. I, I really liked the satire. This was me learning about theatre. This was me learning about satire, getting a, a slightly more nuanced view of comedy than I had previously. And I did that for a number of years and saw a number of his shows. And so to have him come out and show himself to be less of the kind of person that I liked than I thought really hit me hard. And his death and the complex legacy of Barry Humphreys hit me hard as well. Your cultural heroes are sometimes shits. That's basically the takeaway from this one. He had a gift for language, he had a gift for satire, he had a gift for incredibly keen observation. But he didn't have the gift of reflection on his own attitudes to things. But I thought I'd do this video to acknowledge the life and legacy of Barry Humphreys, both good and bad. And to say that I still enjoy watching the Barry McKenzie movies from a nostalgic viewpoint and I can view them differently than I did when I first went to the cinema in Sydney back in 1972 and 1974 to see these movies. They're part of my journey as, as a film buff and they're part of my journey as somebody trying to see a larger world and trying to see things differently in culture and in film. And so I can kind of thank Barry Humphreys for all of those things that I was introduced to because of his work, while still acknowledging the tragic downside of that as well. So that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and leave a comment. You can also support the channel by donating at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies. And you can also watch the commercials in the video so that I get a little bit of AdSense revenue from that. Next time around I'm doing science fiction because it's going to be science fiction Saturday again. And I'll, again I'm watching some British science fiction movies of the 1960s. So anyway, until then, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Watch some movies from problematic people but acknowledge that they're problematic people. And I'll catch you next time.